when I talked to the co-chairs about having this session, I, I wasn't sure if we'd be able to proceed because it's in some ways really inspiring to see what we've seen all day today, as Christian said, that we understand the value of this and we want to expand that value. We want to bring it to more communities. We really want to make sure that it's effective and efficient and, and well-known. But for some of us, the question is, is that the case? And, and so this session is really wants to dive a little bit more into the policymaker side of things, the end user community, and to a certain extent, even your friends and family. How well do they understand the value of space? Do they know what GPS and PNT technologies are? Do they know where weather data comes from? There's a lot of evidence out there that that's not necessarily the case. And so this session, we're gonna take a look at some of those ideas and, and, and have some really amazing experts in media and communications share with you their insights so far in today from, from this event, but also in a more broad sense to really understand how we're doing so far and where we can improve. To give you a sense of this, I did want to start off with a couple of visuals, because one thing I get sometimes from the space community is, well, everybody understands. Everybody loves space. It's so interesting. You know, it's, it's, we all really interested in astronauts and exploration and, and space technologies, and, and there really isn't a problem here. And so I wanted to start with a couple of headlines. You'll notice that most of these relate to the billionaire space race or launch. However, I want to remind all of us that for most people in the world, the distinction between the different areas of the space community are not particularly strong. And so when they see headlines like this, it doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't relate to you. And when they're in such publications as Teen Vogue, we've hit the mainstream. <laughs> you know, this isn't about, you know, some esoteric article buried somewhere. These are what people are clicking on in their daily news life online. And one of these stories here about Spaceport Cornwall also want to show you the consequences when there is a disconnect between how well the public and others understand the value of space for climate change and other areas, you can get pushback and you can get protest. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So to give you one other set of examples, this is a Patagonia ad, a Super Bowl commercial, and an internet meme. The Patagonia ad in particular is a global campaign by one of the world's most committed companies to affecting climate change, arguably. And their campaign was, we are in the business to save our home planet, not Mars. That is not communication that we as a community are benefiting from. Uh, the commercial up there, same thing. That played during one of the largest TV events in the world, and Matthew McConaughey was sort of saying, eh, space, not so useful, not so great. Again, not messaging that we're particularly interested in. And the last thing that we're going to dive into in this session is the understanding of, is it an either or? For many people, they understand space, they understand we're investing in it, but do they understand that we're not taking those resources away, but rather building out the infrastructure that is needed to address global challenges like climate change? So thank you for that. Now I want to introduce uh, my panelists. So we have Camille Bergen, who is the Senior Business Develop, uh, Development Manager for VAST. She is also a well-known space influencer and in STEM communicator uh, known as the Galactic Girl. We have Emma Gatti, who is the Editor-in-Chief of Space Watch Global. We have Wu Li, the producer and senior space correspondent from G, uh, CGTN. And we have Arvind Rachavanandran, the founder of TerraWatch Space. So welcome, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> all right, we're just going to dive right in, because um, I know you all have lots of thoughts on this. Um, I'm going to start over here, um, Arvind. As the founder of a strategic advisory and communications firm that focuses exclusively on Earth observations, satellite data, and its applications. Can you provide some opening thoughts? Do you feel that the space industry is effective at communicating value regarding the use of space assets and data to fight climate change? Who? Where, uh, where do I start, right? Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Um, so as the founder of Terawatt Space, I'll probably give you a quick intro into why I started Terawatt Space. Six years ago, when I got into the space industry, I learned about Earth observation and all the applications and the remote sensing instruments, all of that. And what I realized was, why is this not mainstream? And when I go ask people who used to work in tech with me before in the software world, none of them had any idea what the applications of 
uh, earth observation technologies were. And you know, it was not mainstream. So I was, I was just baffled because there is so much application coming out of it. You, know, you name an industry, you have an application, right? We know that. But then people outside our so-called bubble, what I have come to call the EO bubble or the space bubble, we don't, I mean, they don't realize what the value of Earth observation is, what the value of satellite data is in their everyday lives. So when I left my previous role uh, in a couple of years ago, I decided to start TerraWatch to make Earth observation mainstream. That's, that was kind of the vision for uh, TerraWatch. And if you look at any technology, as you know, if you look at technology in three A's, which is availability, awareness, and adoption, I think in the space industry, we talk a lot about the availability, and we stress so much on availability that we don't really give as much attention to the awareness. I mean, awareness is not just saying, we've launched a satellite. <laughs> it's about the so what, right? Like, what is this satellite? It's a high-resolution satellite. It can monitor and detect trees in high resolution. So what, right? The end user wants to know, so what? Uh, whether you're talking about a customer in the commercial sector or in the public sector. They want to know the so what. And then they want to know, you know, how can they start using it, right? So that's kind of where I think we have a big gap and we have a lot of work to do as a community to, to make that better. And you know, when it comes to climate change, it's, it's, it becomes even worse because it also becomes political at the end of the day. So we also need to convince policymakers where money needs to go in. You, know, you realize that there's a satellite where you, it's important to invest money into that satellite, but then as a policymaker, they need to be convinced. Why is it important to go and put money into the satellite to fill the data gap? I think in the last sessions, we talked about data gaps and what gaps exist in the industry. And if you want to go to a policymaker and make a case, I think they need to understand as well. So there's a lot of work to do in terms of, uh, you know, so maybe let's st I'll stop here and I'll have the uh, inputs from the others. Thank you. I want to move to Camille. You represent two really important stakeholders in this conversation, new space and social media. And I wanted to get your thoughts on how space activities are being portrayed broadly, particularly as we saw in the earlier slides. I mean, do you feel that space tourism is being understood well, its benefits, its value, or is it something that's as kind of frivolous as we saw in, in my carefully selected opening slides? Yeah, <laughs> I definitely don't think it's getting the positive attention that it deserves. As I'm sure you all know, like we see those headlines literally all the time. It's just in our Apple News feed, right? It's just right there in mainstream media. But I think there's space activities in terms of astronomy, and then there's space activities in terms of aerospace, and those are obviously very different. We're aware of that in the room, but a lot of people outside of the space industry do not understand that. But astronomy, I think James Webb, for example, um, is really positive in the mainstream media, even if it's just like this new photo and there's no information about the science or why it's important, but because it's beautiful and, and inspirational, it gets really good positive coverage. Then you look at aerospace and you're looking at like rockets and satellites and stuff, right? Like the stuff that all of us in this room probably work on. And it's either not covered or it's very negative. It's, you know, we, why are we spending money as we saw in those headlines? Why are we spending money? to go to space when we have so many problems to fix here on Earth, including climate change. It was that meme, right? Should we uh, go to space for five minutes or should we solve world hunger? Should we solve climate change? And obviously, to those of us in the room, we know that those are completely not one or the other, as Crystal said at the beginning. Um, so I'm actually presenting a paper on Thursday regarding this exact topic with a lot more information about um, you know, how exactly it's being covered in the media. And when we looked at the data, it's very telling. You look at the word clouds and it's either, as I mentioned, it's either astronomy and exploration and inspiration or it's what are we doing? This is a frivolous use of resources. Uh, you know, the media covers it as billionaires are going to space and leaving us behind and all, this, all these climate change problems. So I think that there's like two very, very different sides of the story. And then the other thing I really, really noticed in the data is that mainstream media rarely, rarely covers the true positive impact of space. Um, and what's even worse is that space news outlets don't really cover it either. And if they do cover it, it's filled with technical jargon that is completely inaccessible to a lot of people. And mainstream outlets, how can we expect them to pick up on this coverage if our own news outlets, one, aren't covering it, or two, aren't making it accessible to people? Yeah, it's interesting what you say about the technical aspect of it. I, I once heard a reporter say to a room full of space companies, 
Um, if you keep sending me press releases about your latest data download, I'm not going to cover you, right? Yeah. There's how do we make this accessible? So Emma, that, that's a perfect lead in for you who is a space journalist and, and you cover a wide range of topics. So I'm curious, can you tell us about the challenges you face and specifically how you've seen the evolution of coverage remain around commercial companies and other space activities as they relate to climate change and other benefit? Thank you, Crystal. Uh, very good question. I'm going to try to answer your question and maybe integrate also with something that Camille just said, try to bring the two things together. So uh, what you, Camille, say is completely true. I mean, like, I think it's a matter of fact. Uh, so if we start from the point that uh, agencies, everybody in the space sector wants to communicate to the outside world. It's not that they don't want to. I think this is a fair point. But uh, my thesis, and I think Camille's thesis, I think everyone's thesis, is that it's not happening, and it's not happening efficiently. So let me give you a bit of um, perspective on what we do and how I see the thing and maybe try to give an answer on why this is happening. Uh, first thing, we see two major issues. The first issue is with the, uh, the public sector, the institu institutions and the agencies. Okay, I macro group them. Uh, they have uh, a density of information, a density of communication that makes impossible to understand to the general public. General public or third parties, okay, can also be politicians, governments, whatever. Why that happen? I ask myself this question every day. Why this is happening? So I have a twofold answer, which I might, or might not be true. To me, it's a cultural issue. And it's a cultural issue on two levels. It's a scientific cultural problem. Science, historically, doesn't like and doesn't care to talk to other people. We like to keep it within us. And I know that because <laughs> I've been a scientist. I'm still a scientist. We don't like it. We've never been in the position that we have to explain why we're getting money from governments, why, we, why our uh, solutions are useful. We just, you know, trust me, I'm a doctor type of approach. <laughs> Top down. We cannot afford it anymore. We don't like it in general. Second thing, still again, the science uh, uh, world. In general, what we really care is the approval of our peers. The most important thing for a scientist is not that you, general person on the street, believe him or her, but that his colleague or her colleagues think that what he's doing is uh, kind of like uh, uh, up to the standard. The second cultural problem is, a, I'm going to tailor this one, I think it's a specific European issue, I see it much less in the US, is an institutional uh, approach. In Europe especially, we believe that something to be institutional has to be serious. It has to be heavy, possibly even boring, because more once something is boring and more people will take you seriously. And this brings all the conversation to an unbearable density, to an extent that then the general public, the young people, or anybody else is like, sorry, I'm not so interested. So this is my perspective. We are missing the target, and if you want to comment on the private companies, I'm having this opposite problem. We receive, I don't know how many press releases a day, okay? I could cover the name of the, of the company, and I could just copy and paste. It's the same corporate language, and I don't know who is writing these press releases, guys, but you can, how many times you, can, you think you can use the word um, disruptive <laughs> until the word disruptive doesn't mean anything, you know, and they all come on. So on one side, my problem is that I'm having the unbearable density of the agencies, and on the other side, the unsustainable lightness of the companies. And you know who is going to hit the target? Teen Vogue! Because they know how to communicate to the public. So for me, the final challenge, and I'm going to wrap up, is that it's not a problem of intensifying the communication, and this is why it's difficult. It's finding a new way to communicate scientific content, which are complex, they have a huge dignity, you cannot just trivialize them, but you have to merge them with a storytelling that can engage the public, that can fulfill them, that can enthusiastically bring them in. And that's the challenge for me. Yeah, we're going to come back to this idea of storytelling in a minute, because I, I think that is, is one of my biggest takeaways from my early conversations ahead, ahead of this actual session with you. But you hit on an interesting point that I don't think I've heard raised before, which is the density within the scientific community. And I, I agree with you. I, I finished a master's not all that long ago, and I actually did a lot on science communications. And I was 
beating my head against the wall with some of my peers in school who, who were exactly like that. Well, no, I can't comment on policy. My job is just to put data out there. I can't, and, and I think the climate change world has seen a narrative of this for 20 years. There's a really famous piece by a woman who went on to be the administrator of NOAA who wrote to the climate change, her fellow climate change scientists and said, hey guys, you need to talk to somebody outside the world. Like climate change is happening and we need to tell people. And, and now we've seen that we've moved forward in that, but we're still struggling how to communicate these very dense technical ideas in ways that are actionable and understandable to others. And so I think that's a really great point. I want to turn to, you, you, you also specifically brought up this idea of a European perspective, because it's easy to say we have a problem, but that doesn't mean the problem is exactly the same everywhere. And so I want to turn to you, Wu, to talk a little bit about some of these topics. You know, how do you see this issue of space and climate change playing out in China or in other Asian media? How do you think it's the same? Where does it differ? You know, what are your observations here? Uh, yeah, Christo, thank you for having me. Uh, actually, this is my first time here in Norway, and uh, talking about the space and climate actions in China and across Asia, and I can tell that uh, uh, more space uh, satellites have been used in China to monitor the carbon emissions and also the weather satellites, the remote sensing satellites. We do see a lot of uh, communications and also uh, satellites here uh, across Asia. Uh, but one thing that uh, a lot of people are now using these satellites we, well, for educational purposes, and especially for the younger generation. I can tell that in China in recent years because we know China has a Tiangong space station and also uh, a lot of the lunar and Mars, uh, em Mars missions. And a lot of younger generations are interested in these kind of uh, uh, space explorations, and especially for climate change. And climate change has been a very global challenge that needs a global response. That's why uh, a lot of uh, scientists and also uh, engineers across China are now uh, telling a lot of stories on social media platforms. They are uh, you know, doing TV interviews, uh, writing uh, papers, articles. Uh, and the one thing that they are doing is to tell the people how to uh, you know, solve the problems, especially with the help of the satellites, and raise awareness, especially with the younger generations. And, and I, I met several, you know, uh, tech reporters, and also uh, a lot of engineers and scientists have become influencers on social media platforms. They are using their own channels to tell the stories, not only for the institutions, but also through their mouth, through their you know, daily lives, they want to show that what is happening in my company, in my work, and what my uh, satellite is working out here, and what I want to tell them. So I can tell that one thing in common with the rest of the world in Asia is that more satellites are now using in the climate actions, and people, especially the scientists, especially engineers, are now uh, realize the importance of being uh, capable of communicating uh, with the rest of the world. So that's what I'm going to talk about here in China and across Asia. Great. And you brought me to my next question perfectly. I wanted to turn back to Camille and talk a little bit specifically about social media, which I think it's fairly obvious can be a positive, but it can also be a negative. And so, you know, as someone who is often interacting with the public directly online in a STEM education role, you know, what is your impression overall of how social media is portraying activities like very large constellations, like launch, like exploration, like Earth observations? And specifically, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly curious about like what kind of comments and feedback do you get? Like how does, like I've seen your education outreach, like I know what it looks like, but what is your sort of, how do you view this in social media and, and what's the reaction you're getting online? Yeah, yeah, so um, it was said in one of the previous sessions that social media algorithms sensationalize and dramatize everything. And that is so true, I resonated so much with that. Uh, I can't remember what session it was in, but like f a finger snaps for you. Um, so when I talk about controversial topics, even if I'm not intending for them to be controversial, so for example, I attended the SLS rollout for the first time last March. Um, I posted a video, it was not a great video at all, uh, but I posted a random video and it got five million views. And the reason for that was again, not because it was a good video, it was literally me like, oh my gosh, look at this like really cool rocket, it's right here, I'm standing right next to it, it was bad. Um, it got five million views, not because it was good, because people were arguing about Elon Musk and Starship, and oh, you're wrong, it's not actually the most powerful rocket in the world, and oh, NASA needs to just stop existing because we have Elon. 
<laughs> and the algorithm picked it up and it went viral because they were arguing, because the social media algorithms love when people argue and when they're controversial. In fact, we often kind of joke about in the content creator world, if you say one slightly wrong thing, your video is gonna go viral. If your video is perfectly accurate, it's not gonna do very well, <laughs> which is not great and very demoralizing, I might say. <laughs> um, so on the flip side, when I talk about climate change satellites or anything, you know, of importance in climate change or, you know, solving our problems here on Earth. Um, let's talk about like methane sat, for example. So I worked with the Environmental Defense Fund um, a couple of weeks ago for Earth Month, and they were working with Bill Nye to talk about methane sat and how we can reduce methane emissions, um, which a lot of people don't really think about outside of, um, you know, the space industry or the climate industry, that methane is actually a very big contributor to the problem. So I talked about it, you know, this really great video, it was very well done, you know, great quality, not my, look at this rocket, guys. Um, <laughs> and because it was factual, it was scientific, it was about a real world problem, there was nothing wrong in the video, and I worked with an actual organization that's combating climate change, it got less than 10,000 views. I have over half a million followers, those numbers don't add up. Um, so, that being said, um, in terms of how space activities are portrayed across social media, it's obviously not very great because the algorithm picks up on the controversial topics, the really, you know, dare I might say, uh, the sexy topics, like, you know, really cool um, rockets that I guess are controversial when they shouldn't be. Um, but constellation or content about constellations and launch and really important missions and how space actually benefits life on Earth just bombs most of the time, and it's really sad. And so in terms of content um, and comments, I don't even look at them anymore because they're so bad. Mm. But we can't blame the public, can we, if the social media algorithms are pushing this content out to them that is wrong, that is sensationalized, that is dramatized, that is intended to spark controversy and arguments and proliferate all of these conspiracy theories. It's not their fault that, they're, that that's what they're being fed. And it's not, that, it's not always their fault that they have these perceptions of the space industry. But instead, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, couple, it's a couple different fold, right? It's um, one, our own issues with communicating our own value. It kind of goes back to my previous point. If we don't even talk about it, how can we expect mainstream news to talk about it? And then two, the algorithms do not favor any sort of scientific or real or non-controversial content. It's definitely something we need to, to figure out. But first, we have to acknowledge that it's an issue. And, and that's definitely one of the first steps to, to taking a look at that. And I want to come back to you. you. You touched a little bit on this in your opening comments. But I want to talk to you a little bit as you know, what would you say to the stakeholders, to the companies, to, to the, the NASA's and the ESA's and, and the other organizations around the world who are, you know, building out this data or making use of it? You know, how can they make your job easier? How can, how can we help you tell this story in a way that is effective? Well, another difficult question. So, I don't think this is, I don't, this is not the right audience to say what I'm just about to say, but we'll say it anyway, since we want to be controversial. Um, stop telling stories starting from your tools. Speaking about satellites, I'm sorry if I'm the one breaking this news to the audience. Humanity doesn't care about satellites. That's a hard truth. They care about the application of satellites for their own needs, for their own dreams. They want us to sell, tell us a story about the potential of these satellites for something bigger, for something that involves them, okay? Because otherwise it becomes a sort of peacock fight. I built three satellites. Oh, I, bu I, bu I built four satellites. You know what? I built five satellites. And then where is the communication? Then of course it's added. Of course nobody cares. So my experience in communication, in science communication, okay, because I don't do generic communication, I do science and space communication, the two secrets, which I'm gonna give you free of charge now. <laughs> 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 but the first one, every story has to have a human component. It has to start from humanity, from our feelings, from our emotions. If you wanna dig in the dirt, you start from the fears. Better not to, because it can become dangerous but you have to start from a starting point that involves humans, otherwise we don't care. And the second one, which is related to this one, is that the art of crafting a good scientific storytelling is taking 
abstract concepts and transforming them in images that our mind can process, which means daily images, daily experiences. If you just give a list of missions, how can people relate to what you're doing? But if you explain the missions using images that can pick up from our daily experiences, speak about food, speak about animals, speak about trees, speak about school, speak about hospital, then people will interact, then people will react. So this is my... Uh... I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I've had this yeah. conversation with satellite companies who will remain nameless, but I've pulled up their website <laughs> and I've said, this is your climate change website. It's pictures of satellites. It's, it's pictures of not even the data, not even the, the outcomes. It is literally click on satellite A, B, or C. That may be effective as a, you know, to the person that you actually need to sell the data to, but that is not who your main audience is. And even those people in many cases, especially when you're working with these outside fields, need to start from a place of what is the data for and work backwards to where does the data come from. So I, I personally couldn't agree with you more. Let's turn over here. You work with clients on some of these issues. Is this, is this well understood? Like, are you, what do your clients think about it? Is it something where you want to teach them from the beginning, or are they coming to you because they understand they have a problem and they need help fixing it? Like, what, what's the status in the private sector here? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm kind of lucky because, you know, I get paid to redesign the websites and the slide <laughs> decks of companies that offer them the service. You know, that's usually step one, because first of all, they want to understand what is this company actually trying to sell? You know, what is the value for me? What is the ROI if I use this satellite data? What is going to be the impact for my organization? What are the benefits that it's going to give me? And you know, it's more so the case, especially in the last year, because a lot of companies have started to take climate and climate risk seriously. So a lot of organizations want to do something about it. And they know somehow satellites have to do something about it, right, for, for monitoring purposes. Uh, or whether it's to report climate risk or whether it's to report emissions. Now, what they need to understand is if they go to their website or do the Google search, you know, that's a different problem. You know, if you have an SEO problem where you go search for something on Google or on a search engine, you'll not be able to find them in the first page, which is a separate conversation. But what we, like you mentioned, what they are fed with is information about the technology, but not the value. And even if we look at slide decks, the slide decks have, I guess, 80% about how cool the technology or the sensor or the data set or the algorithm is, and 20% about the value. It's not the other way around. So that's kind of what is most of the work that I do is you know, enabling the clients to understand. And also, on the other hand, I work with companies in the industry to help figure out what can be the better communication strategy for them, because you know, if, if I prepare a market map, and if I want to, you know, I usually prepare a lot of market maps and, you know, landscapes to help understand for the end user what the market looks like. I can't position all of the companies doing the same thing, because they're all trying to do something different. And sometimes I have to go to them to clarify if really is this what you're doing? Is this where you want to be positioned uh, as you as a company? Because it will have an impact on how the end user decides, right? So, and also has an impact on how politicians decide, right? They can't, they'll probably assume that, okay, we have this one satellite that's doing its job. Maybe there are data gaps and we need to communicate that properly. And more importantly, not just here are the data gaps, but what is the opportunity cost of not filling those data gaps, right? So if we don't communicate that, we won't get the investment from the public sector, and you know, the private sector is becoming more and more interested in space, as we see from the investment trends, and they need to see that trend as well, that there are gaps, there are problems to be fixed, and they need to understand what is the value of fixing those problems with space, and that's what I think we have to do better. So that's a perfect setup. So I want to talk to you a little bit about stakeholders here, right? It's, it's easy to dismiss this to a certain extent, saying, well, I'm still doing what I need to do. My data is coming out. Like, we're doing what we can. But I want to talk a little bit about, you know, one could argue that, yeah, it doesn't really matter if the public understands. If your grandma or, or my, little, my little whatever, you know, my little kids or whatever. But would you agree with that? Or do you, know, do you kind of agree with what he's saying, that it matters for policymakers, it matters for workforce, it matters for investment? Like, where do you think it's most important for? I do think that the, the, it really matters, uh, especially for the company's branding, marketing, and policies, and especially the long-term development. As long as you want to survive in the 
in a competitive world. You need to communicate with the public about your products, your services, and especially your partners. And you need to tell them that your products really matters for humanity, for some people in the world. And if you cannot tell the stories that people don't understand that your service relates to their lives, and your world doesn't really need the services. So that's why I think that it really matters, for, especially for the younger generations. Because now, especially for those who are now, they, they don't watch TV, they don't watch papers, they just uh, use their cell phones and uh, really everything on the social media. So we need to tell them through different uh, social media platforms and we need to tell them what really matters for the future. And that is why I think today, the companies, the stakeholders need to focus on the potential and the prospects of the young generation, younger generations. And we need to tell them, and communicate with them, hear their advices, and to modify our the, the products and services, and to tell them a story about their life. And I remember that uh, that every time in in the space launch in China, there are some coastal areas. Uh, every time. Hundreds of people, they bring their children there, and we, we see them that the children watching the rockets blasting off, and they are, wow, this is really great. I think that thing that gives them a, a dreams about working in the space or being an astronaut or uh, in, the, in the scientific field, working in the sci science field. So that's why I think that every time we, we, we have a product, we have a service, we need to tell them. What I really agree with what Emma was saying, that uh, we, we need to tell them from the perspective of our life and to tell them uh, why it really matters to my life and how to interact with uh, people and, and especially really through social media platforms. Excellent. So we are going to take a few audience questions. I see a few rolling in, so I'm giving you the three-minute warning. I'm going to do a rapid-fire round as my, one of my last questions, and then I'm going to turn to audience questions. So definitely get on the Slido and put them in. Um, so we talked about some of the bad. So now I want to do a, a short rapid-fire question, which is give me a good example. Where, where have you seen um, positive interaction? And so while you think I'll start, um, I put a headline up about Spaceport Cornwall and their um, interaction with some very um, high-profile uh, protest groups. But I can also tell you that they worked really hard within their local community and with many of those groups to overcome that impression. And you can do another Google search and you'll find some of the stories where they did a lot of actual local community outreach. We talk a lot about media and social media, but communication doesn't just happen online. It doesn't just happen in what's left of print media. It also happens in your communities. And I think that's something that we can often forget about. So that was my example. Um, if you're comfortable, just start over here. We'll go around. So a positive example where we have communicated well. I think it is... I have to say, I've been in the industry for the last six years, and it's been on the positive trend in terms of how we have tried to communicate, whether it's the space agencies um, or companies. Things are changing, things are evolving, because for companies, you know, it's their business case. If they don't communicate, the end users will not come to them. Investors won't understand them. Same with space agencies. If they don't communicate, they're not going to get the funding. And I think ESA has been doing a very, very good job. And I was at the uh, Meteosat third generation launch, uh, and I think everything that was done about you know, people usually forget about the part about the thing that comes after launch, you know, what happens, you know, what's, what's the satellite, what does it do, what is the commercial benefit, what is the societal benefit, what is the environmental benefit. I think that event was very well put together uh, by ESA and, and a lot of people, especially because, you know, I was there in the event and quite a few people who I know um, watched the event were able to come out with, okay, this is a very important sal satellite and I could not believe that I didn't know this before. So I think that's what... And that's what, what I had six years ago. I cannot believe that I didn't know this before. It's the kind of best case scenario reaction for anybody who's learning about uh, the, the importance of space for climate change. And I think uh, Issa did that very well. I agree. Hmm. I'm trying to think. I think um, one thing that really hit me was the Inspiration 4 documentary on Netflix. Um, I know that, you know, Jared had a lot of money to make that happen, but that was a very strategic part of that mission to communicate to people on Netflix, and Netflix makes great documentaries, in my opinion, about the Inspiration4 mission. And it was, you know, of course, there were headlines around that mission of, you know, billionaire goes to space, and he's just buying a really, really expensive vacation, and, oh, he is raising money for St. Jude. Well, I guess we'll talk about that. But in terms of the documentary and in terms of, like, what we put out, and it was collective with Jared, 
Jared's help and the I4 crew, but also SpaceX. Um, that was a really, really powerful documentary, and I just I, I wish that it had gotten a lot more like public mainstream coverage. Emma, I give you two examples. I love it. Both coming from the Norwegian Space Agency, which oh. is. <laughs> <laughs> That is an agent. We follow all agencies, but I have two good examples from, uh, from them. The first one is this morning, the concert with the uh, young female artist on stage. It was very powerful. It was immediate. It was fresh. It was real. You cannot beat something like that. That's how it should be. It was young, finally, you know, young person on stage taking the stage. I loved it. I think it was fantastic. The second one. Brussels 2023 is January, it's raining outside in front of the palace where we're having the space, um, the European Space Forums. There are big panels and each space agency from Europe was exposing the big panels and each panel is the same because we are very conservative in our communication. So they are all dark blue and black, of course, space blue, and they're having this very thick list of satellites, written very small, very, very small. I wonder who made that? How do you think that outside in January in Brussels, people are going to stop 20 minutes per panel to read each satellite mission you're doing? Again, you're not thinking about the target. You're thinking about yourself. There was only one agency that did something different the Norwegian Space Agency. The panel was green and white, so already standing out. Also intelligent from a communication point of view because it's the only one that is different. Big images, no big text, and obviously already calling with the storyline of climate because they choose the right palette. And that was a very intelligent, very clever way to communicate. So kudos to that. Yeah, it's not just about stories, it's about visuals, right? Of course, exactly. there are different ways to communicate. The storyline is also visual. Exactly. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, actually, I have almost uh, uh, one million followers on Facebook and Twitter, and uh, reviewing all the posts I have made, that uh, many of these, uh, uh, you know, good examples are that interactive with the audience, especially uh, when we talk about the space launches and the, the, the uh, different satellites, and also SpaceX, Elon Musk. Different stories can be told, and people can feel that uh, this real this launch really matters. And especially, I remember that one uh, influencer on the social media as a 74 years old teacher, and he, he retired, and he, she talked about how to make different uh, experiments on the social media platforms. And also Elon Musk, you know, different SpaceX, different missions will give us different feedbacks. And every time we, we watch this uh, the live stream about that space launches, and really give me a more uh, examples. And I remember that uh, a lot of uh, space photographers, every time when they go to uh, different space launches, they will update every uh, pictures and also uh, they will make kind of uh, animation about how to live on Mars and also how to uh, live on different planets. So these kind of examples that really, uh, I think this is a good example, how to use, uh, make full use of this uh, uh, you know, animation and video and also documentary uh, and pictures. We combine them together and to, to put that all, on all the platforms. So I think today, uh, for, for the companies, if you don't have the professional uh, capability, you can work with the media, with the tech reporters, with different, you know, companies, then we can work together to make the communications better. Because I think different people may have different you know, their work, and if you focus on the science, that's okay. And we can come to work together, to work with the influencers, work with the, uh, you know, companies and the tech reporters, and we can tell the stories better. So that's why I think today the forum, the, our panels, we want to tell the stories that we need the communication, we need the service, we need the information, so that we can understand mutually, and this, so that we can find the right angle, find the right, you know, form to tell the audiences about what this story is. Absolutely. So we have some really great questions, actually. So thank you, everybody. You answered my call. Um, I'm going to start with one from Jenny. She says, I do a lot of STEM outreach work. And without fail, small young children say space is cool. So the question is, at what age and why do you think we lose the general public's interest? Um, I'll start with a very short story of what alerted me to this problem to begin with, which is my teenage stepdaughter 
uh, is very interested in things like climate change and other global problems, very active online, and was consistently sharing really negative space stories, many of which were inaccurate. And I would like go and be like, that's not actually true. Um, and it really alerted me to this online community interaction. And, and that's what sort of got me going down this. And so I think it is. I think it's as, as young people grow and, and see this exposure to some of these, these negative headlines that we're talking about. But does anyone else have insight into that? Camille? Yeah, so I think I think you um, touched on that perfectly. That especially like the next generation, the younger generation right now, they really care. And we talked about this um, in an earlier uh, session today. They really care about the climate and sustainability, and so they want to go into in industries that are perceived as sustainably and environmentally conscious. The space industry is not perceived as that. Um, and so I don't really know, of course it depends on region and the individual person and the education system that they're in, but so I don't really know what exactly, when, when exactly they would um, you know, lose their interest in it, but it's a very common fact that a lot of really young kids want to be an astronaut and then maybe like middle school, they're like, oh no, I want nothing to do with space. And it's, it's meeting that younger generation generation where they're at and, you know, really working on our communication skills um, so that we are seen as environmentally conscious and um, beneficial to climate change. Yeah, I think what I'll add is what I've observed also over the last six years, you know, I try to keep one foot in, in the inside space world and one foot outside as an outsider. And what I feel is they don't feel like they have anything to do because they're the only or two career paths they can imagine is rocket scientist or astronaut. You know, maybe they have, they're wearing glasses or they are scared, so they don't want to be a rocket astronaut or they're not interested in engineering. So I think the roles seem to be very limited, but what we need to convey is how multidisciplinary it is. And, you know, especially when it comes to climate, what something that I'm very, very interested in and, you know, I, I want to see more work is you know, the way we communicate our visualization and the way we communicate about our satellite data. It's not just images. And mm -hmm. I have linked a few interesting pieces in, you know, a few of my newsletters from the Financial Times and New York Times. They have done very, very good work in terms of just, you know, there was one recently about uh, talking about the GRACE mission, which is a NASA um, DLR mission, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the GRACE mission, and there was a Financial Times piece that just talked about how the mission worked, how the how the satellites work, because the satellites are in tandem, and they try to make it as simple as possible without taking away the science, which is very important, it's because it's science communication. And, and I got a message from someone, because I started, shared it on social media, that are there, is there work about you know, just visualizing things? You know, do you think that's a work that exists in the space industry? And I was like, yes, that is a work, because nobody is doing that today. All we're doing is just showing images, or we're showing graphs, are we showing rockets and satellites? And that's about it. But that if we were to communicate about the impact of climate change, I think we need to visualize better. We're collecting so much data now. So people need to, I think we need to also tell people that it's not the only career path and there are a lot of other career paths in so that they don't lose their interest because they want to do something about it. They just don't know how. So we have an interesting question here. I'm, I'm going to go for a slightly, it's about controversy. And I, and I think it's an interesting question because they really were clearly listening to, to some of what we're saying. So, if we say we need online controversy, if we're saying that's part of what, how we fix some of the SEO, the search engine optimization issues, climate change has no shortage of those. Yep. Um, so space agencies, and I'll add this, other space organizations, you know, typically right now they stay out of politics. But is that a mistake? You know, is this something that they should lean into? I, I'll start over here with our, our space yeah. reporters. What do you think? Yeah, uh, actually today I talked with uh, President IAF and also Norwegian Space Agency uh, the Director General and Azerbaijan uh, Space Agency Director, and they all say, share the same message that uh, there is no boundary in space. We all share the same planet, the Earth, and uh, no matter what happening is uh, any controversies or politics or here on Earth, we all need to work together to solve the problems. Uh, because the space technology has a great potential to, uh, you know, for the solutions for climate change. Uh, we have understand it, and that, that is why we need to, uh, you know, work together to solve the problems, no matter any solutions. But uh, even with the uh, uh, controversies, we, we need to sit together and to talk and to find an effective way to, you know, leave the controversies and find the solutions for the you know, sharing data, how to make full use of the satellites, and uh, to solve the problems with the limited resources. 
Any other comments on that? Well, so partially, the space and the war is a scientific and the war. So in general, science tries to shy away from uh, political uh, uh, controversies, if it can, especially when the controversy is like completely scientifically unproven. I never met anyone from the, from the space sector, whether an agency or not, that has never declared openly climate change is an issue and we are tackling it. Never. There's never been a single denier. And this morning, Dr. Ashbaka said, yeah, there are still some random scientists again that, but the space field is compact in that. So it's not that I don't think, it's not, I don't think it's shy away from the controversy. It's fighting the controversy in its own way, which is data matter-of-fact, provable things. So yeah, they don't go in uh, television on Teen Vogue saying, well, this is not true, and throwing mud against others, but they do work endlessly and tirelessly to actually provide all the information that they can against these controversies. And there is something to add this. I mean, if we, we all maybe have some understanding of when the controversy becomes conspiracy. And that becomes a very dangerous area and for scientists that work every day with real data, it becomes also a complex question to address, because if I show you a picture of the Earth that is round, do I really want to spend mm. one hour, two hours, one week, six weeks of my life convincing someone that there is a controversy behind that, that maybe it's flat? No, I don't want to. So I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure I completely agree with the fact that we shy away from controversy. We do fight them in our own way with data. Interesting. So we have just enough time for one last question. Um, and we've actually got some really great ones online. And I'm, I'm kind of sad I can't get to all of these because there's some really specific, interesting things here. I think what I'm going to do is actually combine what I had planned as my last question and an audience question. So we have a question from the audience that says essentially, hey, there's a level of simplification that is needed to reach the public, but that is difficult when you're talking about science, um, you know, when you want to be accurate enough to an expert perspective. And so I want to open this up for final thoughts. Say so you've been here for a day already. We've been talking about all sorts of these issues. What are your observations? How can we meet that challenge? And, and where can we improve? You know, ideally with some specific examples. So I, I definitely rec open, I'm open to observations um, as, as much as we've seen them today. But, you know, what is your, your departing message to this community? say, okay, here's where we can make hopefully fairly immediate improvements. We'll just, uh, we'll just go around the room. Start over here. Sure. Um, I think one thing that I really believe in is what you said about simplification, but not oversimplification, especially in a subject like climate change, what we're talking about. The complexity of what we are conveying needs to be understood by the end user that you know, they need to understand. I don't think they need to be scientists, but then they need to understand the concept of predictions, they need to understand the concept of probabilities. We can't expect them to understand, but then we need to find a way to, to convey that better. Because it's not, you know, there are, there are there's science that needs to be decoded and demystified for the end user, and the process for happening, uh, process of that happening, that, that also needs to be conveyed. Because what we don't want is, what I don't want also, is, is a world where we end up in a black box, where we, we, we just just trust someone who says, this is what it is, and we don't want to live in that world. You know, I think end users will also, I think there will be a lot of questions if you make it a black box. I think, I guess the parting message is, we need to convey that space is a solution for climate change, but it is not going to solve climate change. And people need to come in and take action based on what we are conveying, and what we are conveying has value in terms of making action happen. Um, so I'll first start by saying I'm really impressed by how many conversations we're having already on day one about communication. Um, I'll tell you a very quick story. Uh, Crystal approached me last year to speak on a panel very similar to this at the Space Sustainability Conference in London. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but to our knowledge, I don't think we had ever talked about space communications like this at a conference like this, um, or it really wasn't a conversation at all. Um, and so to have this conference where we have been talking about it literally all day long in various sessions um, that weren't specific for communication, but then to have a specific communication panel and then to have an entire technical uh, track um, on Thursday about that, like it's incredible. So first of all, I just wanna say, um, I'm, really, I'm, I'm really pleased to see this conversation um, expanding. But in terms of, I, I completely agree on simplicity. So I wanna do a quick poll of the room if you guys will interact with me. I know we're at the end of the day. Um, so is anyone in here a graphic designer? 
Is anyone in here, um, let's say, an influencer, both either STEM or not STEM? Then yeah, 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 okay, okay. We got a couple. Um, that's good, that's good. Um, is anyone in here from a social media company? Nope, okay, cool. Um, how many marketing or communications professionals are in here? One, 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 two, three, okay, okay. Four, four, okay, yeah. And um, I think we can do better next time. I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Last two closing thoughts, Emma? So, um, yes. Uh, want to add something to what you say. I completely agree the difference between simplify and oversimplify. I think too often in the mind of the scientists or the agencies, simplify and oversimplify is the same thing. They are not the same thing. You can still reduce the concept from 10 to 1, and that single concept can still be true and scientifically correct. But simplification is, is important. It's fundamental. I will also add something else. Light it up. Yes, to be a bit more engaging, a bit more light. It doesn't have to be heavy. He can be engaging in a light way. He should be, because this is how people get drawn to that. Now, we'll add the last one. To me, when it comes to communication, contamination with art is the way for a new way to communicate, because art is more immediate than science. Okay? This is why kids like to draw immediately. They don't build rockets, at least not physically speaking. You know? So bring in painters, musicians, digital artists, filmmakers, uh, poets, writers, whoever you want to, but this will help to light it up and find a common new ground to create together a new language of communication. Absolutely. Yeah. And our last thoughts. Yes, today we talked with uh, the policymakers, the scientists, and what really impressed me most is that the time, you know, the, the urgency of climate and uh, actions and space. We know, all know the potentials of space technologies, but now the question is, how to use these technologies to put that into action, to walk the talk, to put all the words and all the, our discussions, our, you know, uh, topics can be into concrete measures. We can work together to make that measures to be turned into real actions. I think that's why we need to communicate with the public. What are the potential challenges? How to make that into actions? What we, do we work together? I think the time and also other challenges for these topics in the space and climate actions. Absolutely. Well, thank you to my panelists for engaging with me on this topic, for scaring us a little, but offering also some very concrete concepts and ideas for how we can communicate and tell our stories and integrate more and hopefully get out ahead of some of this so that we don't end up with an investment and a workforce and, and additional problems um, to what we already have now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you.